So my name is Ryan Marr. I am a sophomore in aerospace and mechanical engineering. And in my spare time, um, I go caving. And my focus in caving is cave photography, which um, is like photography squared. Um, it requires all of this gear that you see here because in a cave, uh, there is no light at all. And the only light that you see in any photos are the lights that are supplied by the photographer. Um, so we use anywhere from the digital flashes that you usually see on top of a camera uh, to these uh, ancient technologies that are called flash bulbs. They're not made anymore, um, but they put out a lot of light compared to the strobes. Uh, so for really big passages or big caves, we use those more frequently. We use these little ones and they, these, believe it or not, can put out more light than this can. So the light sources that I use, um, this is one of the smallest ones I use. This is called a thyristor and it is a form of digital uh, flash that when you turn it on, it powers up the internal circuitry and there's a little tube in there that is filled with an inert gas and when you press the button it puts a high current through it and discharges energy out of the gas. Um, this is a bigger strobe that I have. This is a Canon one. Um, was a lot more expensive. A little bit more powerful. Not too much more powerful though as far as, uh, as, far as overall light sources go. But moving up, we move into flash bulbs, and believe it or not, this little thing here can put out more light than one of these. And the reason that we use these um, is because they're small and they can put out a lot of light, but the reason that we don't use them very often is because they're not made anymore. So a lot of these are purchased off of eBay, and it's just out of personal stocks that you know other people have and they're trying to get rid of. To give you a compar comparison here, you can set this off and you can see that it was bright. You can set this off and see that it's even brighter. And then moving up in the world, you can set this off and see that it's really bright. In fact, I can feel the heat on my face from behind. So when we do take a picture, I will look around the cave first and find out where I want the camera to be set up. And almost immediately at the same time, I'm envisioning lights. Um, so when I look at a scene, I don't just look at it as my headlamp sees it, I look at it with the idea that I'm gonna have six or seven lights lighting up this, this area and from different angles and different powers. And um, so when I figure out where I want it, I will put different people in different places and different flashes in different places. Some of them are wirelessly synced so they just fire off with the camera, but some of them can't be so some of them have to be manually fired uh, by a person. And generally speaking there's at least one person in every photo and uh, sometimes there's two or three, but sometimes there's actually more than, than that um, and only one of them is actually visible at a time because everybody else is hiding behind something holding lights for me. And to actually fire the photo, if I'm using strobes in the digital flashes, I can just take the picture and see if it looks good, and if it's not good, I can just adjust it. Um, with the flash bulbs, though, you have to be very careful because the, the exposures have to be right with them because you can't adjust their output. So we'll usually uh, set off one flash. If there's four or five people with four or five different lights, so usually set off one, one flash bulb or two flash bulbs to check the exposure of them. And then uh, when we go to take the actual photo, we will take uh, one photo with all the bulbs going off. In some cases, with really complex photos, 
uh, or with bulbs that are really big and expensive to mitigate the risk of losing the entire photo because one bulb doesn't go off. We'll actually take one photo for each bulb going off and then stack them digitally later. I am Ryan Marr. I am a sophomore going into a junior year of mechanical and aerospace engineering at West Virginia University. Um, Andrew Megley, I'm a sophomore at WVU. I am Emily Dillon, I'm a freshman at uh, WVU. Uh, I go caving just for the adventure. Uh, in my mind, I've always, I've always wanted to have the adventure where you can explore something new, but in today's day and age, everything's mapped. So underground is like the only, the last frontier. I started caving, I had never been in a cave actually before um, our beginner's weekend with the grotto. And during our orientation, I had told myself that I needed to join at least one club. And this was the only one that, uh, now this was the best one that seemed to fit what I was interested in pursuing, which was just kind of um, to satisfy my curiosity. Like every cave is different and going underground is amazing. It's beautiful and it uh, challenges my, um, me physically and kind of mentally sometimes. And that means that every trip becomes a learning experience and every next trip I do something slightly different on. Uh, and the amount of progress seen in just a year is amazing. Um, of course it helps when you are completely obsessed with it. Photographs tend to be the face of caving. Um, when people think about caving, they tend to think about people crawling around in muddy holes in the ground, which is part of it. But at the same time, there is a, a beauty to it, uh, a grandeur to it, that people who cave frequently and people who, who do this hobby know those feelings of, of awe and beauty and grandeur, but uh, for people who don't do it, the only way they can kind of get an idea of what it's like is to see photos. And uh, that's what I try to do. Isn't always so much to, you know, to document the cave just to be like, hey, this is what this cave looks like, but to have a feeling of this is what it feels like to be there. This is what it it is like to be there and do all this. Um, so when I see a picture that evokes that feeling, uh, I count it as a successful trip.